Um, before we begin with the 12 steps, though, there's a 13th step, uh, or call it a preliminary step, because a lot of people don't like the number 13, they're superstitious about it, that we need to begin with. Uh, and we do this before we even begin thinking about the 12 steps. Uh, there's, a, there's a question you need to ask yourself, and it's a very deep personal question that you need to ask yourself. And the question is, am I the right type of person to be running my own business? Do I have what it takes to be an entrepreneur? I mean, if you've ever taken a course on small business before, this is where people traditionally begin. What they do is the, the infamous pop quiz. Do you have what it takes to be an entrepreneur? 20 true-false questions. Do you ever see these in magazines or like, like, like newspaper articles? You know, do you have 20 true false? You know, question number one, in your spare time, would you rather be A, climbing a mountain, B, writing a book, C, starting a business? I mean, come on, people. I mean, do you, does it take any you need real genius to figure out what the, question, the answer to that question should be? Um, first of all, let, let me tell you something. I'm not going to do that to you guys. I'm really not going to do that to you because I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm really convinced that a lot of these entrepreneur quizzes are, are worthless. They really are. Uh, because they all presume that somewhere out there, there is this perfect entrepreneur personality type. And the closer you come to that perfect platonic ideal of the entrepreneur, of the perfect entrepreneur, the more likely it is you're going to be successful uh, in business. And, and, and I just got two words for that. It's horse manure. It is absolute horse manure. Take it from somebody who has worked with over 15,000 entrepreneurs in his lifetime. There is no such thing as an entrepreneur personality type. There's no such thing as a perfect Way, way of looking at the world when you're an entrepreneur. Uh, the successful entrepreneurs that I have worked with in my life look exactly like you do. They're all over the place. You know, sometimes it's the quiet ones that go on to become multimillionaires, and it's the macho, you know, self-assured chest-beating chest chest types that end up crashing and burning and going bankrupt in six months. You can't generalize from a person's personality type to how well they're going to perform as an entrepreneur because too many different kinds of people can succeed at this, and too many different kinds of people can fail at this. Whatever kind of personality type you have, you can be successful as an entrepreneur. That's the good news. That's the positive news. But, and there's always a but, to be as successful as an entrepreneur, there are certain qualities that you are going to have to develop over time. Uh, I used to give this lecture years ago, I used to call it the three personality traits of successful entrepreneurs. And I stopped doing that because personality traits kind of sounds like you're born with these things. And if it's one thing I've learned you, in, in, in working with entrepreneurs you, and business owners, um, you don't have to be born with these things. These things can be learned. Uh, whatever your background, whatever your prior history in life, you can develop these qualities. That's the good news. The bad news is you are going to have to develop them, I think. Um, in working with as many people as I have, I see patterns. I see patterns in the ones that work and patterns in the ones that don't. And a lot of the times when, the, when a business fails, when a business doesn't do well, when it crashes and burns, it ultimately comes down to the, the founders, the people that started the business. They just weren't the right type of people to start and run that type of business. Do you remember the old ads on TV, guns don't kill people, people uh, kill people? Remember that? Guns don't kill people, people kill people. That's true of businesses too. Legal, tax, accounting, and financial problems very seldom kill businesses. I mean, these are the things that people worry about, but they very rarely kill businesses. What kills businesses more than anything else are the founders, the people that have started the business not being the right types of people. When you're running a business of your own, any kind of a business, if you're a self-employed professional running a, a small retail business or starting up an entrepreneurial tech-oriented company, doesn't matter which, there's a certain way in which you have to look at the world and it boils down to three essential qualities. I look for these. When I take on clients uh, in my consulting practice, uh, I do a lot, of, a lot of, of consulting for entrepreneurs, I look for these three qualities in the people that I deal with. I'm actually going to be looking for it in you uh, in the course of our five weeks together. Uh, I'm going to be looking for some of these qualities in you uh, and see which ones you've got and which ones need to be improved. Um, I, I, and I do this because I see these three qualities in virtually every one of my successful entrepreneur clients, male, female, old, young, makes absolutely no difference. Um, if the three things are there, they're much more likely to succeed than if they're not there. And usually when a client of mine fails, when a client's business goes under uh, or they go bankrupt or they crash and burn, I can almost always trace it back 
to a failure in one of these three things that I'm going to be talking to. So, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying these are the only three things you need. I'm not saying that once you develop these three qualities, you will absolutely be successful. It's a guarantee. No, I am not saying that. But I really do believe that these three things that I'm going to talk about in the next hour are the building blocks upon which everything else is built. One of your first goals when you're thinking about starting any kind of a business is to ask yourself, do I have these three qualities? And if not, can I develop them? Can I develop, can I, can I look at the world the way Cliff is telling me that I should look at the world? Now, I'm going to put some words on the board to describe these three qualities that I know are going to be a little controversial. In fact, in one case, I'm going to put a word on the board that I know you're going to find downright unpleasant. And I'm going to warn you about that in advance. Um, but I do this for a reason. I do this because, number one, it is late at night and I want to make sure I keep you guys awake for another hour listening to me. But also, too, I pick these words because I want you to think about what they really mean. Uh, these are some words that have gotten a real bad rap in our English language. And I think that people, other people don't really know what they mean. Uh, I want to explain to you what they really do mean because I, these are the best words that I have found to describe how it is that my successful clients look at the world and my unsuccessful clients do not look at the world. So without any further ado, let's start talking about these three qualities that successful entrepreneurs have, at least every one that I have ever worked with. Quality number one, cynicism. Successful entrepreneurs and business owners are cynical people to a man and woman. Now, this is not a very nice word, okay? If we're at a cocktail party and I point to someone you've never seen before and I say that's a real cynical person over there, it doesn't really sound like a compliment, does it? Okay, but, but you gotta look this word up. Seriously, when you guys go home tonight or, or you have some quiet time, look, at, look this word up on Wikipedia or in a dictionary. It does not mean what you think it does. It does not mean negative or pessimistic. In fact, I gotta tell you, this is one aspect of the entrepreneur myth that is accurate. Entrepreneurs in general, successful ones, tend to be fairly positive people. They're not negative. Uh, a, a pessimist is somebody who looks at the world always negative. They see the glass as half empty, not half full. And in my experience, pessimists make lousy entrepreneurs. Uh, they do. I mean, I think if you're gonna be in this world and taking the kind of risks that we entrepreneurs take, you gotta have a little faith going on here. I think you've got to be able to look at the world in a positive way. I, I, pessimists, in my experience, make jet, like horrible entrepreneurs. But pessimists are not cynics. Cynic, a cynic is something quite different. A cynic is somebody who looks at the world without illusions of any kind. Uh, if you want, you can call a cynic a realist. A cynic is not a romantic. A cynic is not um, someone who looks at the world through rose-colored glasses. A cynic is not an intellectual, by the way. Some of you are probably wondering, you know, why is it that there's no correlation between a person's education and how well they succeed as an entrepreneur? Have you ever wondered about this? You know, a lot of PhDs from Harvard do not become rich. And often, very often, it's people with very limited educations that go on to become, you know, multimillionaires or billionaires. Have you ever wondered why this is? This is why, I'm actually gonna explain this to you. Because if you're an A student, Right, which is how you become an intellectual or a professor or a PhD at Harvard, okay? If you're an intellectual, you have to kind of fall in love with theories. You know, we teachers here, our, go our mission in life, teachers, professors, instructors, whatever you want to call us, our mission in life is to help you understand the world better. My job as a, teach as a teacher is to help you understand the world of entrepreneurship better than you did when you first walked in the door this evening. And in order to teach you, I'm going to be t using models and theories and rules and, and other tools to help you understand how this world works. Now, if you if you're really truly are into this and you want to become a professor of entrepreneurship someday, you're going to have to master these tools, get very, very good at them, understand how the theories work, and figure out how to teach them to others. But you don't really have to know these theories to run a successful business. In fact, they can actually be a handicap. Your education can actually be a handicap when you're starting a business. Why? Because when you're, edu you're over-educated for running a particular business, all you see are the theories and the rules and the models, and those are not the real world. The real world is kind of messy out there. You know, the rules don't always apply. There's exceptions within exceptions within exceptions. Things don't always follow the rules. And in the real world of being or running a business, you've got to see things the way they really are, not the way the professors, including me, told you it would be. So, an education can be a handicap sometimes, especially if you're the kind of person who's obsessed with the whys and wherefores of things. It's going to be hard for you to look at the world the way a successful entrepreneur does. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not saying that, a, that successful entrepreneurs are dumb 
or stupid. Far from that. They are extremely intelligent people. What they are not is intellectuals. Successful entrepreneurs don't use their brains as much as they use their five senses. Sight, hearing, taste, touch, smell. They're intelligent in that way. They don't fall in love with ideas and things that are inside their head. In fact, if anything, they distrust what's inside their head. What a, success, what a cynical person says is, what's in here isn't real. It's, it only lives between my ears. When I die, this stuff's all going to die with me. What's out there is real. That's reality. You're all real in this room today. That camera is real right now. Not the stuff that's going on inside my head. That's all, that's all fogs, smoke, and mirror is all this is. A cynic is somebody who said, this is what's real. So I'm going to use my five senses and I'm going to soak up as much information about what's really going on in that world without any illusions, without any romantic ideas, without any theories or preconceptions. I'm going to look at what's out there the way it really is, messy, warts and all. And when I see things happening, when I see changes in what's going on in that world, I'm going to sit back and ask myself, how do I exploit those? for my personal gain. That's what an entrepreneur does. An entrepreneur looks at the world the way it really is, without illusions, without dreams, without any romantic ideas. And when they see things going on in that real world, they take them at face value. They don't make value judgments on these. They, their attitude is, oh, OK, that's what's going on in the world. OK, now how do I adapt to that? How do I make money from it? That's what a successful entrepreneur does. So now let me give you some of an example about this, one that's maybe not so nice to talk about. I tend to use very dramatic examples in this class. You should be forewarned about that. Liquor stores. We've all been in one fairly recently, some of us more frequently than others, and that's perfectly OK. Um, but we all know what a liquor store is all about, right? Here's a statistic, and this actually comes from the retail liquor trade. Uh, uh, the typical retail liquor store in the United States of America, anywhere in the country, on average, what percentage of their business comes from alcoholics, people who drink too much? What percentage of their revenue comes from serving alcoholics? Believe it or not, there's actually a measurement of this. Somebody who uh, has, drinks more than 12 standard-sized drinks in a, in a week is technically considered an alcoholic. I guess that's, that, that's the measurement that they use for this. Uh, you don't have, please don't, do, not, do not react to that in any way. Um, that's just one measurement of it. Anybody want to guess? Throw me a number. 1%. 1%. Too small? Three. Three? OK. Fifty. Fifty, a little too high. OK, you're getting close. According to the retail liquor trade in certain publications, trade publications in the retail liquor trade, the average liquor store, the average liquor store's revenue, 30 to 35 percent of their revenue comes from people who are technically alcoholics by this definition. And this should not surprise you. If you think about it, you've all heard the saying that 80% of your business comes from 20% of your customers, right? You've all heard that saying, right? Well, let me ask you, if you're in a liquor store, who's buying a bottle of Jack Daniels for personal consumption every three days? You know, hopefully nobody in this room, certainly not me, okay? But the fact of the matter is that people who buy lots and lots of liquor tend to account for more, a disproportionate share of the typical retail liquor store's uh, revenue. Pretty surprising. Uh, by the way, what I've just done here is I've totally destroyed the liquor store experience for all of you. The next time you're in your liquor store, what you're going to be thinking about now is, you know, what Cliff is saying is that on average, one out of every three people in this store right now are alcoholics. That guy over there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, him, definitely. And that lady over there? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah she goes for this stuff too, right? And you know what? What you don't know is that they've all taken this class before of mine here at, here at, the, here at the college here, and they're all looking at you and they're saying, mm -hmm. this one over there, that's right. This, this is what's going to happen here. This is, this, is, this is part of the liquor store experience here. Um, now, some of you are horrified by this. How many of you here are surprised by what I just told you about that 30 to that 30, 35% number? It's pretty scary, isn't it? Right? How many of you here are disturbed by this information? How many of you here feel that that's not a good thing. Okay. It's perfectly okay. It's perfectly okay to feel that way. It's just that you're not the right person to run a liquor store. That's all. If you're in running a retail liquor store, the worst thing you can do is to start a mission to cure alcoholism. That is not your mission. Having an AA booth right next to the cash register is not going to help you build that business. Okay. A, a cynical, your job as a liquor store owner, obviously you want to encourage people to drink responsibly, I'm not saying that, but if you're running a liquor store, your job is not to discourage people in their bad habits, okay, at least not too much, okay? Obviously if they're passing out, dropping dead in the store, that's not a good thing either, you know, at least you want to wait until they got out of the parking lot, you know, so you can blame it on somebody else, but, but at least until that point, you want to make sure that that's not happening. Here's how a cynical retail liquor store owner would have reacted to that information. 
okay, this is interesting. That's more than I thought it would have been. What Cliff is saying is that to be successful in a retail liquor business, what I've got to find, I've got to find a community um, somewhere in this area where there's a relatively high percentage of alcoholics and a relatively low number of other liquor stores serving though, that community. Well, now let me think, are there, any other, are there any communities in this area that fit that description? See, that's how a cynical person looks at the world. They take that information, they accept it at face value, and they figure out a way to make it work for them in, in a positive business way. That's how a cynical person looks at the world. And you can think of a lot of other examples, too, of how this works. Uh, when we talk about marketing in the next session, we're going to learn about this. You cannot make money selling to people that aren't real. Now, that may sound so basic. You cannot sell, make money selling to anybody who's not real. Okay? But you'd be amazed how many business owners fall into that trap. Because they don't know their customers well enough, they sell to their idea of what those people might be like. And the trouble with doing that is, well, the trouble with that is when you start doing stuff like that, you start stereotyping people. And stereotyping is a bad thing to do just morally and ethically, but it's also a dumb thing to do because stereotypes don't buy anything. Only real people buy things. When you're looking at customers, you've got to look at them the way they really are, good and bad, warts and positive features. You've got to see them the way they really are as human beings if you're going to be able to sell to them effectively. And this is where your cynicism comes into play very, in, in a very big way. So that's what cynicism is all about. It's looking at the world the way it really is, not getting caught up in ideas or illusions about the way the world is. Using your five senses to see what's really going on in that world and then figuring out how you can use that information to your best advantage. So that's number one. Quality number two of the successful entrepreneur. Insecurity. Insecurity. When you're, when you're running your own business, it's perfectly okay to be a little afraid. In fact, I'll be honest with you, I think you're crazy if you're not, if, if you're not a little afraid running a business for yourself in uncertain times, I think you're a little crazy. Uh, it's not only okay though to be insecure, it's essential. Fear can be one of your best friends when you run a business for yourself. And this may sound a little, little counterintuitive, but it's true. Fear can be one of your best friends when you run your own business because fear keeps you focused. It keeps you a little bit off balance. When you're afraid of something, when you're nervous about something, what's going on with your five senses? They, they get heightened, don't they? Let me, give you, let me give you an easy example. Let's say you go to see a movie um, you know, in downtown area, kind of a questionable borderline neighborhood, okay? Uh, it's, you know, you go to the movie, it's 8 o'clock at night, and it's one of those art house movies that goes on for like four or five hours, right? So you're coming out of that movie at 1 o'clock in the morning in a rough neighborhood, and you've got to walk three blocks in pitch darkness to get to your car where you parked your car. Tell me what's going on right now with your five senses, right? You're, you're, you're sharp, right? You're looking, you're listening for things that you never normally listen to, right? You know, if a cat jumps off a garbage can three blocks away, you're going to jump straight up to heaven right now. That's what's going on here. Right? Any little shadow, you're going to look at it close, you know, to make sure that's not some, 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 some criminal guy lurking in the, in the shadows, right? You don't normally do that when you're walking down the street, but you're going to do it now, right? That's what fear does. And that's, by the way, why bad things don't tend not to happen to you when you're in a situation like that, because you really are focused. Believe it or not, they actually have done studies on this. Accidents very rarely happen to people when they're on vacation. It's unusual. Your, 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 your odds of having an accident when you're on vacation are much lower than they are at any other time because you're in a strange environment, you're in a new, different country, a different city, whatever, and you're looking at everything's new, so you're paying more attention to little things than you normally do. Yet, where do most accidents happen? In the home, or if you're driving, within five miles of the home. You know these streets. You know, you, you know how to get from point A to point B. I know how to get to my UPS store every day. So I'm driving along. I'm on cruise control. My mind is wandering. And I'm not seeing that soccer ball go bouncing out between the two cars with the kid jump, racing after it. And that's how accidents happen is because I'm too much in my comfort zone. We can all think of situations where even big companies have failed miserably because they got too comfortable and too complacent with things. Uh, and what fear does is it keeps you focused. Um, every once in a while, I'll, hear a, I'll, I'll have a client or somebody come up to me and say, you know, Cliff, you know, I took your class years ago, and, and, and I, I now have built a successful business. But you know what? It's taken me a few years, but thank goodness I now know what I'm doing. I feel good about this. I'm comfortable. I'm in a routine. I really have figured it all out. I know what all the risks are, and I'm just comfortable now. I, for the first time, I feel like I really know what I'm, what I'm doing. And whenever I hear somebody say that, you know how I respond? You poor bastard. There is a brick flying at your head at 90 miles an hour right now that's going to crush your skull, and you are not seeing it because you are not looking for it. Okay, you, you guys want a quiz? You guys want a pop quiz? Okay, 
Here, here's my, here's Cliff Anico's pop quiz, okay? Rabbits. Have you ever seen a rabbit? A real rabbit, not a cartoon rabbit up close and personal, like in a petting zoo or in a pet store or something like that, right? Describe the rabbit to me. When you, when you look at a rabbit, what's it doing? What's going on? It's fidgeting. It's fidgeting, right? The nose is twitching, the ears are twitching, the hairs are on edge, right? Even if the thing is asleep, by the way. It, part of the rabbit, the, a rabbit is never completely at rest unless it's dead. Okay, I mean, whenever a rabbit is alive, even if it's fast asleep, some part of the rabbit is moving. Now, why is that? Why is the rabbit that way? How, why is it that evolution has designed the rabbit this way? Answer, because the rabbit knows its place in the food chain. This is not an animal that rampages through the jungle, killing and eating any other animal that, 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 that's why the whole idea of a killer rabbit is so funny, right? Because that's not the way rabbits are. Rabbits know their place. They know that they are at the other end of the Darwinian stick. They are more often prey than predator. And they know this. So if, you're, if a rabbit is sitting in, in your backyard munching on some grass or something, and he sees a leaf twitching at 10 o'clock over here, he says to himself in rabbit language, now that can be any one of a number of things. That could just be a raindrop or a piece of dew or a bug making that thing go like that. Or that could be something coming to eat me. I'm not going to hang around and worry about this. I'm going to get the hell out of here and go down my hole. And that is how rabbits survive, by being neurotic, basically, okay? Okay, now, let's shift gears. Let's talk for a moment about lions. You ever see a lion, a real lion, in a zoo? Isn't that the most disappointing-ass thing you ever saw in your life? Right? I mean, you, you expect to see this sort of majestic, noble king of beasts. And when you're looking at this thing, this, this flea-written thing, what is, it, what is it doing most of the time? It's sleeping. It's crapped out there on the rock, right? And, and let me tell you, it's not just because they're on drugs or anything like that. R lions are very much like that in the, in the wild, too. Because you know, let's face it, the, the lion you know, is also very much aware of its place in things. I mean, he knows his role in the Darwinian scheme of things. He knows that if he wants to take a snooze on a rock in broad daylight, you know, pause up in the middle of the day, there aren't a whole lot of other animals that are going to go up to him and say, hey, buddy, you're on my rock. Get the hell out of here. It's not going to happen, right? Yeah, that's the truth. Except for those pesky two-legged things with the shotguns and the pith helmets. Except for those things, you've got to watch out for them. Other than that, the lion doesn't have a whole lot to worry about here, and he knows that. So he knows he can get away with that. Now, here's your quiz, okay? When you are starting a business from scratch for the first time, do you more closely resemble A, the rabbit, or B, the lion? You're rabbits, people. That's what you are. You know, and that's the thing. The, the, uh, I actually wrote a book a bunch of years ago when I was doing my Money Hunt show on PBS. Uh, it was actually called Money Hunt. And the very first story it was a collection of 27 stories of entrepreneurs that, that I'd worked with. And the very first one chapter was called The Insecure Rabbit Lives Longest. And that's one of the best lessons I can give you. May you never figure out 100% what it is you're doing. That's my little wish for you, all of you. It may sound weird, but it's true. May you never completely figure out what it is that you're doing. May you always have questions. May you always be a little bit neurotic about doing the right, about the, that you may not be doing the right thing at times, because that lack of knowledge, that fear, will keep you focused. And I will tell you something, a very amazing thing. When you are neurotic, truly neurotic, not only do you see problems before they become life-threatening, which of course is one of the best things about being neurotic. You can see problems while they're still relatively small and you can deal with them easily before they get out of control. You will also see opportunities that other people won't see. It's almost like you get x-ray vision. Because you're so neurotic and you're so focused on things, you will stumble on changes in the marketplace and other things before, before they're so big that everybody sees them. And that gives you an advantage over your competition, okay? I have time for this story, so I'm going to tell it. Um, you all know what a UPS store is, right? Okay, they used to be known as mailboxes, etc. Okay, back in the 1980s, when I was first starting up in business on my own, I used a mailboxes, etc. Uh, outlet as one of my uh, to, to, as my mail drop because I didn't want to use my home address as my mail drop. And I dealt uh, with the owner of one of the local uh, stores. I, I don't want to mention names because obviously that you, know, you might be able to figure out who that person is. Uh, but this person ran a store, and it was a very, very tragic situation. This person uh, was born overseas, had married a, a Marine. Uh, had come to this country speaking very, very little English. Um, you know, the husband worked for a corporation for a while, but then he decided to become, uh, to buy a mailboxes, et cetera, franchise. Um, he bought the store. Uh, she had three kids, you know, two young, three, ki three young kids, one of whom was in diapers. And about three or four years after buying the store, the husband died very tragically of cancer uh, at the age of 42. 
Uh, it was a very, very sad thing. I mean, the guy was diagnosed in July. He was dead in October. Now, the franchise gave her an, an option. They said, well, either you can, you can, you know, we'll buy you out, we'll find somebody to buy your store, and we'll cash you out, or we'll train you, and we'll teach you how to run the store. Now, she'd never run a business in her life, this lady. I mean, she had never even thought about being a business owner. So, but she decided, she figured out that if she bought, if she, if she, if she took over the store, she'd make more money in the long run. So she ended up taking over the store. And here's what happened to her, something very interesting. Now, of course, she was scared. She was neurotic. I mean, she went through all the franchise training. The franchise was extremely, you know, supportive of her, but she was still neurotic. She was scared to death about what was going to happen here because she'd never run a business before. She'd never been trained to run a business. And of course, all of us customers, we were very helpful. Every time we walked into the store, she'd say, hey, Cliff, good, you're here. Tell me, the copier, is anybody using it? Should I get rid of this copier? Should I keep the copier? Should I upgrade to a color copier? You know, she would ask a million questions of everybody, every customer who walked in the door. And of course, we're all her friends. We all knew her husband very well. We wanted her to succeed. We tried to help her out until one day I actually gave her a good piece of advice. That actually happens from time to time. I actually said, you know what? Rather than asking everybody who comes in the door for advice, why don't you do this? Write your questions down, make photocopies, and stick them in people's mailboxes. You know, because that, that, it'll save a lot of time. That way we can look at the questions, we can help you out. And this way you're, you're getting advice from all your customers, not just a couple of us. Oh, good idea. So she started doing that. Okay? And we started giving advice. Okay? And, and that was it. And this went on for several months. Well, one night, this lady was up late at night. She'd put the kid to bed, and she was reading her, her local newspaper. You know how your local newspaper has a section of uh, new, new business listings? They list all the new businesses that are opening in town. Well, she took a look at that. And she saw something in there that made her blood turn cold. At the time that I'm talking about, and I'm going back now quite a number of years, there was a franchise that used to compete with mailboxes, the mailboxes, etc. franchise. And what they used to do is they would wait for a mailboxes to go in, and they would open up an outlet right down the street and offer things at, at significant discounts. Uh, from the mailboxes stores. Exactly the same business, but for a fraction of the price. And by the way, uh, don't, don't feel badly about this. We actually have a name for this in business. We call that the Burger King strategy, because back in the 50s and 60s, that's what Burger King used to do. Uh, they didn't spend a dime on real estate. What they used to do is they'd wait to see where the McDonald's were going, and then they would open up down the street. It was exactly the same uh, copycat strategy. It's perfectly legal. I mean, it'd be nice, but it's perfectly legal to do business this way, right? Well, she saw a business opening up in town. It was right across the street from hers, and it had a name that was suspiciously similar to that other franchise. Now, any one of us probably would have looked at that and said, you know what, it's late at night, I'm hallucinating, I'm just, I'm just overtired, I'm going to go to bed, I'm not going to worry about this. But not her. She couldn't sleep that night. The next morning, as soon as things got a little quiet in her store, she went to the liquor store next door and asked to use their phone. Why did she go next door to use the phone? Because she didn't want this phone call to be traced. She called the other franchise, the competing franchise. Hello, my name is Sarah Jones, and I live in such and such a town, and I wanna, I'm very much interested in buying one of your franchises. Will you sell one to me? Uh, you're where? Okay, what zip code? Zip code, okay. They, five minutes, she's on the phone on hold for a minute. Lady comes back on, I'm really sorry, we can't help you. Uh, we just sold that franchise to somebody else living in your town. Oh, that is too bad. Where are they going to be located? Right across the street. This is what was going to happen. It was that other business, right? Well, she freaked out. I mean, because she knows, all oh, these people, they don't know what they're doing. They're Americans. They speak English better than I do. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm going to have all these problems. This is, uh, her, the next three weeks was one sentence that she never finished. You'd walk into the store, she'd be on this sentence. It was, like, it was like one of those Tibetan mantras that go on thousands and thousands of times. She just couldn't stop. She was so afraid. She was like in tears for like a week because she just didn't think that she could handle this because they, they, they offered their service. This other franchise offered services at a discount. The people that ran it were Native American, you know, natural born Americans. They spoke better English. She was paranoid about about losing her business and, of course, losing her livelihood. And this went on for about a, about a week or two. And then she thought of something, a crazy idea. It was the kind of thing that happens at 3 o'clock in the morning. Remember I told you about those surveys that she used to do in the mailboxes for the customers? Well, one of the questions she always, I, I actually told her to ask this question, was where does your new business come from? You know, if you're a new customer, where did you hear about us? And she remembered that almost every new customer she's had in the last year um, said the same thing in response to that question. They learned about her business through the Val Packs. You know the Val Packs, those, those, those packages of ads that you get in the, in the, in the mail every week? 95% of all her new business came from those Val Packs. And she knew that because of the surveys that she, of her customers that she did, those regular surveys. She had an idea. And here was the idea. The next day, she went out. Her husband had a $50,000 line of credit with American Express. She hit that line up 
for $30,000 in one, in one sitting. And here's what she did with that $30,000. She called up every Valpac company in the state and bought Valpacs, bought a, a one-year ad contract in every Valpac in our state. Now, why did she do it? Why did she, why did she, what was her idea? What was she thinking of here? Well, think about it. When you get a Valpac in the mail, do you ever see two Chinese restaurants or two, chi or two dry cleaners, right? All right, it's, now you're starting to see a couple, but back then, 20, 20 or so years ago that I'm going back now, you didn't see that. What they did, when you bought a Valpac ad, they gave you what they call category exclusivity. You, were the, you would be the only Chinese restaurant. You would be the only Italian pizza place. You would be the only dry cleaner, whatever. Her strategy was, she, here's, here's how she thought. She thought, since I get all my business from the Valpacs, that other store across the street, they're going to get all their business from Valpacs as well. So if I buy ads in all the Valpacs in the state, they will not be able to get ads in Valpacs and they won't get any new business. That was her logic. How many of you here would have done something like that? How many of you think that that's a logical way of thinking? Okay, well she took out all these Valpacs. She spent like $25,000 because these ads were actually back then fairly expensive, okay? And here's and a very interesting thing happened. No sooner did these Valpac things started going out, she started getting a ton of new business. People were coming in like three, four, five a day to open mailboxes, to open private mailboxes. She had never had traffic like this before in her life. It got to the point where she filled up all her existing mailboxes within like three or four weeks. Um, when the, um, when, a, when a, a beauty parlor next door went out of business, she called up the landlord and said, hey, I need that space next door. Please, uh, I need that space. Uh, rent the space to me. Uh, give me the lease. I'll sign it. I don't care what the rent is. Can you believe that? Can you imagine that? Calling a landlord and asking for them to sign a lease without even asking what the rent is? Of course, I'm, I'm a lawyer by trade. Can you imagine how I reacted when she told me about this? Are you crazy? You didn't even ask, the, didn't try to negotiate the rent. I need the space, Cliff. I need the space. I need mailboxes. So she tore down the walls. She expanded into that space. Within six months, she had that filled up. The, uh, the liquor store next door when we moved uh, their location, she did exactly the same thing. She took that space, sight unseen, you know, put it, fill in whatever number you want, landlord, I'll pay the rent, and she expanded into that space. She had, within two years, the fastest growing private mailbox company in New England doing all this. She actually went from having like 75 mailboxes to 600 mailboxes within a period of two years. Um, an, an incredible, you know, what is this? What's this? It's like a six over a 600 percent growth in her business, you know, year over year, right? Oh, well, by the way, while we're talking about this, whatever happened to that other that other business, that one that was going to open across the street, never opened their doors. Can't imagine why. Okay, can't imagine why. Okay. Well, here's the moral of the story, okay? What happened here? By the way, what happened? Something that she could have never predicted in a million years. Her husband, when she, when he, her late husband, when he ran the business, he only took out Valpacs in the town where the shop was located, okay? But you know something? Here's a trick. Uh, how many of you here live in a town different from where you work? Quite a few people, right? A lot of people do, especially here in the Northeast. That happens a lot. You live in town A, you, you, live, you, you work in town B. When it comes to local newspapers, where, what newspapers do you get? Do you get the newspapers where you live or where you work? You get them where you live, right? If you live in town A, you work in town B, very rarely do you subscribe to the town B newspapers. But if you want to open a private mailbox for a small business, where do you, and you're working a day job, it's kind of like a moonlighting thing, you're doing it evenings and weekends, where do you want to have your mailbox? Do you want to have it convenient to work or convenient to home? You probably want it convenient to work, don't you? There was a huge untapped market of people who worked in that town but lived somewhere else that wanted to have a mailbox close to their workplace. And by taking out all these Valpacs around the state, she was reaching those people for the first time. And that's why she was getting all this new business. So here's a situation, folks, where by trying to defeat a competitor, and, and by the way, she paid off that credit line in like six months. I mean, it was incredible uh, how fast she was able to pay that off with all the new business. It was an incredible, an incredible success story. And the amazing thing is she still owns this store today. It's since changed you know, names a couple of times. Um, you know, she's now part of a, different, of a different system. The amazing thing is she's still neurotic. If you walk into that store, oh, good, you're new. Hi, where'd you hear about us? Okay, Valpac, hey, listen, this color copier, should I keep it? Should I lose it? People aren't using it. Is this something you would use? Yada, yada. She's still as neurotic as she always was. She still doesn't think of herself as a successful business person. That's what I mean about being neurotic. That's what I mean about being nervous. Sometimes, you, sometimes by being crazy, by being neurotic, you, you open the door to amazing opportunities that you never would have seen otherwise. And that's, that's my lesson. Okay. 
These are the first two qualities, and so far these are pretty, un these are pretty uncontroversial. I'm not hearing a lot of feedback from you guys. I'm not, not, not a lot of pushback. But now we get to the third one, and the third one is tough. This is a tough one. I do have a perfect word for this third quality, but it's one I guarantee you're not going to like too much. And I apologize to you in advance. It's kind of an ugly word. Uh, I'm going to tell you that right now. It's a word you're not going to like. Um, but look, I mean, I, look, I don't want this to be, this is not a course in semantics. This is a course in how to succeed in business, okay? Uh, I, I don't pull any punches in this program, and I'm not going to, okay? Um, I'm going to put the word up. Here's, here's the deal. To, to avoid offending anybody's sensibilities, I'm going to put four words up on the board. Any one of them will work for me, okay? Uh, but I think you know me well enough by now to know the word that, that I like the best, okay? But to, to be a little politically correct, I'm going to put four words up on the board for this all important, and by the way, this is the most important quality of all. This is the one that more than anything else is the make or break difference between a successful business and a failure, more so even than these other two things, okay? Cliff, would you shut up and write the words on the board, please? We don't have all night here. This is what they call a build-up, by the way. It's a very effective public speaking technique if you ever do some talks and stuff like that. Okay. Word number one, alternative number one, aggression. Word number two, audacity. Word number three, chutzpah. So spell it any way you wish. <clears throat> okay. Anybody here not know what chutzpah is, by the way? Um, it's a Yiddish word. Uh, it, it, it's one of those words you can't explain. You can only illustrate it. <clears throat> Someone who murders both of his parents, okay, he kills both his parents, and then when he's caught by the police, he throws himself on the mercy of the court because he's an orphan. That's what we mean by chutzpah. Somebody brazen audacity, somebody with brass, you know what, okay? That's what we mean by, by chutzpah. Somebody who will tell you, you know, straight, with a straight face, as a woman, I can tell you, and I'm obviously not a woman. I mean, that's what we mean by, by chutzpah. Somebody, you know, you know, somebody who can tell you to go to hell in such a way that you actually look forward to the trip, that's somebody with chutzpah, okay? <clears throat> but my favorite word, sorry folks, Stand back for a moment, let it sink in. How many of you here think of yourselves as ruthless people? I'm not seeing a whole lot of, okay, a couple, a couple of hands in the back of the room, yeah, right, you, sure, sure, right. Yeah, your wife's sitting right next to you too, I'm, I'm, sure she'll, I'm sure she'll agree with that, right? Would you agree with him? Okay, probably not. Seriously. This is another one of those words, folks, though, that has gotten, I mean, this is a bad word, right? If we're at a cocktail party and I say that's a real ruthless person over there, you're not going to go anywhere near this person, right? But when you go home tonight, this is another one of those words <clears throat> that has gotten a very bad rap in our language. I want you to go home and I want you to look this word up. Look it up in Wikipedia. Look it up in a dictionary. It does not mean what you think it does. It does not mean unethical. It does not mean sleazy. It does not mean any of those things. Ruthlessness, ruthlessness is another way of saying heedless or reckless or relentless. Somebody who, doesn't, who goes through life and doesn't worry too much about what the consequences of their actions are is a ruthless person. Isn't this right? Isn't this what we mean? When we say that somebody is ruthless, we're saying when that person sees something they want, they get it no matter what it takes, no matter what obstacles come up in the way, no matter how much pain and suffering they have to suffer, no matter how much pain and suffering other people around them may have to suffer, they don't worry about that. They get there and they clean up the messes later, if at all. That's what a two-year-old child is a perfectly ruthless individual. And no one would ever in their right mind say that a two-year-old kid was unethical or immoral, right? Because a two-year-old kid doesn't have that kind of moral judgment yet. But how many people here know two-year-old know, know two kids? Au pairs? You work with two-year-old kids? Is that right? Am I right about this? Okay. You know, a two-year-old, when a two-year-old child sees something they want, okay, what do they think? Okay, I know I'm not supposed to do this. You know, mom's looking at me, the au pair's looking at me. Okay. Uh, you know, I mean, if I, I, I know that, that, that I'm probably going to get a timeout, you know, for this, you know, if I'm caught, and I probably will be caught because they're looking right at me. But you know what? That lamp is so cool. I, I, am, I you know, I, I'm going for this thing because I know, I, I've learned enough to know mom that well enough she's not going to kill me. 
You know, there's this place called jail, and the au pair, if I say some bad words, they're going to deport her back to Lithuania. So I don't care about this, okay? I'm going to go for that wimp because I know that I'll survive the experience. That's what ruthless, that's, that's the third quality that I'm, have you ever heard the expression, uh, I would rather beg for forgiveness than ask for permission? You ever heard that expression? That is the perfect expression of what we're looking for here. That's exactly what we're going for. Now, obviously there are a number of places where ruthlessness comes into play. Most obviously in dealing with your competitors, you don't want to give your, never give your competitors an even break. How many people, for example, now think about this. Uh, my, my friend who had the mailbox store that I talked about a little earlier in the evening, remember she took out all those Valpak ads specifically for the purpose of keeping a competitor from opening their doors. Now, didn't this strike you as being a little bit unfair? I mean, shouldn't she have given them, this is America after all, shouldn't she have given that other store a fair chance to at least get up and running and give, it a, give her a shot? You're all shaking your heads here, okay? The answer is, you, if you know you got a big competitor down the road, you do everything possible to keep it from being born. That's part of what that third, this third quality. She was being utterly, she wouldn't have thought of herself as ruthless. If you told her this was ruthless behavior, she probably would have disagreed with you. But she was acting in a very ruthless way. She was, she was trying to keep a competitor from opening its doors. That's pretty ruthless behavior. Here are some examples of ruthlessness in action that don't have to do with competitors, though. Let's talk about raising money. Years ago, I had... Uh, when I worked on Wall Street, I worked for a big law firm, and I had a, a legal secretary who was very well known. She worked for a number of prominent partners. Uh, she was very well known in the legal community. She used to schedule court hearings and stuff like that. Very efficient. Probably the best secretary I've ever had in my life. Um, well, a couple of years after I was working, after I left this firm to go elsewhere, um, I got a nice little engraved invitation in the, in the mail from this former secretary of mine. Apparently, she had left the firm too, and she and a friend were going to set up a temporary employment agency in Midtown Manhattan, in the heart of New York City, a temporary employment agency for lawyers. Now, at the time, in the mid-1980s, this was a radical new concept. You know, lawyers were starting to work, a number of companies were starting to hire lawyers on a temporary basis to work just on individual projects, you know, not as permanent employees. This was a big thing in the mid-80s. So she got the bright idea of setting up a temp agency to help these companies find, temp, you know, good quality temporary lawyers. She knew the legal business very well. She knew how to pick good people. So she and a friend decided to launch this business. And what I got in the mail was an engraved invitation to their launch party, which was held at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. Uh, in Midtown Manhattan, one of the most elegant, opulent hotels in New York City. She'd actually rented the ballroom of the Waldorf Astoria for this launch party to launch her new business. So it was on a Sunday, and I figured, hey, I'm in town anyway. I'll swing by. I liked her anyway. Let me see what, let me see what she's up to. So when I went to this, this party, the, again, the, the swankiest ballroom in New York City, I walked into a room of maybe 250 people, and I knew everybody in that room. There were partners from the old firm. There were some of the judges uh, that she used to deal with. She had invited everyone on her Rolodex to this launch party. And I knew all these people. Do you see what's coming? Okay? And she came out, you know, after, after, after cocktails and stuff, and everybody was there, she came out, and she was a very attractive woman to begin with, but she had on this beautiful Givenchy uh, cocktail gown. And she had a diamond choker around her neck that must have cost like $10,000 even back then in 1980s money. I mean, she was just dressed to kill at this party. And she greeted everybody, and of course we had a great time. We were reminiscing about life at the firm, all this other stuff. And then as the party went on, right before they brought out the dessert stuff, okay, because uh, this was like a buffet type thing, these two guys come out wearing matching black outfits and shaved heads. And of course, you know, you know these, are the, these, are the, these are the muscle guys, right? And they came out with a flip chart. And they put the flip chart up in front at, at, the, at the head table. And she got up there and she kind of waved everybody. She said, Can you please be quiet, please. Uh, first of all, let me thank you all uh, for coming out here. I'm really honored. I'm really flattered that, that those of you from my, from my past life have, have thought enough of me uh, to come out here and, uh, and support me in my new business venture. Uh, since this is a launch party, since we are um, you know, starting up a new business here from scratch, what I want to do for the next few minutes is I want to walk you through my business plan to tell you what me and my partner are going to be doing. So she got up there and she started walking through it. So if this were nowadays, you'd use a PowerPoint presentation and a laptop, but this was 1985, so we still use flip charts and stuff like that. And she talked about who the market was going to be, how she was going to target uh, her, her, her corporate customers, where she was going to find the lawyers. She went through all of this, and then she got to the very last chart. Remember, she hadn't served dessert yet. Okay, this is, you always do this right before dessert if you're going to pull this one off. And the very last chart, the very last piece of paper had this on it. Big dollar sign. And this is what she said. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, my partner and I have been very successful in raising funds. However, we find ourselves $50,000 short of our goal for getting this business. Because this is a high-end business, we need to rent very expensive space in Midtown Manhattan. You all know how expensive that is. Uh, we need to have a certain image here, and we need $50,000. I'm asking you all here to please help me. Uh, there's a young gentleman in, in the, I'm asking you to please loan this to me. I'm not asking you to give it to me. I'm going to pay it back with interest at 8%, which at the time was a very good uh, rate of interest. Um, if you can only, I would like to ask each of you to please loan me maybe two or $3,000, but if you can only loan me $500, that'll be perfectly well. Uh, there's a young man in the back. He's, he's a, a lawyer that I'm working with. He will actually draft an IOU from my business, and I promise you that when we make money, the very first thing that I will do is I will pay these loans back with interest. Uh, but without the $50,000, I may not be able to get this business off the ground. Thank you in advance for your support. Now let's all enjoy dessert. That's what she said. Now if you were in that audience right now, what are you thinking? Oh man, <laughs> you know, I got, I mean, don't you feel a little like sandbagged here? A and to be fair, if you were an audience of total strangers, that probably would have been right. I mean, if I, if, I, if I didn't know who this person was, I would have stormed out of that room, you know, right then and there. And I said, this is ridiculous. What a, what a fraud, right? Yet, think about it, we all knew her. We weren't strangers. We liked her. We all knew her. Let me tell you something. She raised $65,000 at that event. I loaned her $1,000, and I never do that. I'm the cheapest son of a gun in the world. If you can get money out of me, kid, you're good. That's all I can tell you, right? We all, because we knew her, we liked her, and let's face it, if you go to a launch party, you kind of have to expect that they're going to handle you for money a little bit. That's just the way the world works in that, in that field, okay? Um, okay, so, so she raised $65,000, which, after paying off the Waldorf Astoria, after paying off the caterer, after, um, after paying off the dress shop that had rented her the Givenchy dress, that wasn't hers, after paying off Tiffany's for the loan of the $10,000 diamond choker, she had the $50,000 she needed to get her business off the ground. She had actually spent $15,000 of, uh, of credit card debt to launch just for that one four-hour cocktail party in the hopes that she would raise enough money that she could, she could launch her business. That's the third quality that I am talking about. How many of you would do something like that? to raise money for a startup business. How many of you, I'm not seeing too many hands, but that's because you're not her. Let me tell you, she built that into a $5 million business and she ended up selling it uh, five years later to one of the top HR consulting firms in New York City uh, that she worked for for about as a, as, a, as a partner for 10 years until she retired. She has, I, I still look at cards from her period. She has a net worth of about $25 million today. Okay, that's what taking risks can do. But here's my favorite story. My favorite story of ruthlessness in action has nothing to do with, 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 with any of this. It's, it's actually one of my best fun stories. Uh, this is one of my favorite people. She's not a client of mine. I should warn you about this. I've never worked with her professionally. Uh, she's just a very dear friend. But she is my, if I had to pick the perfect example of what a successful entrepreneur is, I could do no better than, than talk about this particular person. I wish we had time because I would bring her here and have her talk to you. I think it would be a very enlightening thing, but she has no time. She's very, very busy. Now, to show you how ruthless this individual is, most people would rather die than have me mention their name in one of my crazy examples. I mean, how many of you here would like me talking about you with my name in front of a bunch of strangers, right? You probably wouldn't care for that too much. You probably would be pretty ticked off. This lady will only allow me to tell this story if I tell you who she is. That's the deal. I asked her for permission to tell this story, and she actually made, she actually had her lawyer draft up a one-page letter agreement, which I signed. That's how good she was. She actually spent legal fees on this, so that, saying that whenever I tell this story, I must tell you who she is. She wants free advertising, is what she wants. That was the deal, right? So I gotta tell you, her name is Judy. And you may have heard of her. Uh, she runs a, a small chain of jewelry shops called J. Albert Johnson. Do you listen to the uh, local TV station, J. Albert Johnson Jewelers, Judy from J. Albert Johnson? That is not an actress, that's her. That is really her. She is the owner of this very small chain of two or three jewelry shops here in Fairfield County called J. Albert Johnson, and she personally runs the store on Black Rock Turnpike in Fairfield, Connecticut, State Route 58, the one right next to the Shore Supermarket. I have to say this. I am under contract to tell you this information, because otherwise she will not let me tell you the story. I'm a very dear fan of Judy's. I, I do buy a fair amount of jewelry for my wife, and the story I'm about to tell you is the story about how three years ago I paid $4,000. Judy talked me into paying $4,000 for a tennis bracelet. Okay, this is my story. It was Thanksgiving 2006. 
right? Uh, I'm, in, I'm in the supermarket next door. I'm shopping for some groceries. And I figure, you know what? I better go to the jewelry store and look for some stuff. You know, Christmas is coming. I want to get something from my wife. So I go to the jewelry store next door. She's, and Judy's sitting behind the desk. She takes one look at me. Cliff, she brightens up. Cliff, thank goodness you're here. Yes, it's the holidays. It's Christmas coming up. And you're buying me want to buy something for your wife, right? Yes. Okay. Come here. Come here. Come here. Look, I just got some beautiful estate pieces. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, your wife would absolutely love that. Look at that. You know, she, she's dragging me all around the store, showing me this stuff. Saying, Judy, Judy, calm, calm down, 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 girl, heel, down, down. You, Judy, come on, calm down, calm down, calm down. I know you're excited to see me. This is great. You know, nice girl. I said, but you know, she's very tiny. You can do this to her. Um, I said, but 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 look, you, you know me. I mean, and to be fair, I'm probably one of her better customers. I probably buy two to three pieces of jewelry from her a year, which for a jewelry store is pretty good. I mean, that makes me probably one of her best customers. I said, look, you know me, Judy. I like your stuff. Uh, she always has very interesting stuff because her husband's a designer. Uh, so she always has very un unique pieces, things you don't see a lot, and her prices are usually pretty fair. Uh, so I said, you know, Ju Judy, I, look, I, I know how you feel about this, but, but look, you know, I, I think the world of you, if I'm going to buy from anybody, I'm going to buy from you. You don't have to do this whole thing with me. She goes, Cliff, you don't understand. Take a look around the store. Do you see anybody else? No. Think about that. When was the last time you were in a jewelry store where you had to wait to get service? Has that ever happened to you? No. Usually when you go into a jewelry store, you're the only person there. Or maybe there's a couple over in the corner looking at engagement rings or what they call those Pandora things that the, that the kids all like now. You know, but you pretty much got the whole store to yourself. And she says that that's the, way, that's the way jewelry stores are. At the holidays, you go to the shopping mall, right? The jewelry stores are where you go to get away from all the, the hustle and bustle, right? These are the islands of calm, right? Well, Judy, tell me, the jewelry business is very much like that, Cliff. There are days where I only see one or two customers in the store the entire day. You know, those people are not leaving here without buying something. You know, they are going out of this, they are leaving the store either with a box or in one. That is her, I mean, her attitude is take no prisoners. This is the way she is. Every customer is important and she's got to make sure that they buy something. That is, that's the, the culture of that business. That's why jewelry store salespeople tend to be a little on the aggressive side. You ever notice that? That's why that is. Because you may be the last customer they see for hours. That could happen. All right, so I said, well, but Judy, you know me. You don't have to do this with me. I'm one of your better customers. You know I like to zen shop. I like to walk around and sort of let things jump up and hit me. Let me do my zen things. He goes, all right, do your zen, do your zen. Call me when you need me, right? So I go looking and of course, I see two things and they're at opposite ends of the store. So I'm going over here and I'm looking over here. And then finally I go over here and I look over here. And then I walk back again and I look over here. Finally, after about six passes, Judy says, stop, enough already. You're making me seasick. Let me take the two pieces out of the case and put them side by side so you can see them. And they were two beautiful pieces. One was a diamond and onyx ring that she had on sale for $1,500, which was a very good price for it. And the other item was a tennis bracelet with six carats of diamonds that she had priced at discount for $4,000. And believe me, it was worth every penny of it. I mean, it was a gorgeous, gorgeous piece. And she looked at me, she goes, Cliff, I don't understand. You're a very decisive guy, and this is an easy decision. It's the tennis bracelet. You're absolutely right. You're, you have a good eye for jewelry. Dolores is going to love it. She, this is fabulous. I don't understand. You, what, what's the problem here? Well, what, is, 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 you know, what's the issue here? Is it the money? I said, well, you know, obviously $4,000 is not chump change. I mean, I don't spend that every day. I'm not, I'm not wealthy. I can afford it. I'm not wealthy, though. But I have another concern. Because what other concern could there be? I said, well, let me explain, Judy. As you know, you know my wife. My wife works. She works in an office. And whenever I buy her jewelry, I always want to buy her things that aren't going to be wasted, things that she would wear every day at work. Now, the diamond and onyx ring is beautiful. She could wear that at work every day. But a tennis bracelet, I mean, with six carats of diamonds, I mean, come on. It's, it's, just, it's not the kind of piece you can really wear in a work environment. It's, it's the kind of thing you would wear, like, at a charity ball or, you know, some kind of very formal event. And my wife and I just don't do a lot of that kind of stuff. I, I don't mind spending that kind of money on jewelry, but I want to make sure that it's a piece that she's actually going to wear. And I'm nervous that she's not going to wear this, that, that all that have many opportunities to wear this piece. And I don't want to waste money on, on, on stuff. Now, let me ask you this. Is that a pretty good explanation? Is that a pretty good, a pretty good argument? Most of you would say that, right? Now, if you were Judy, what would most of you do? Now, keep in mind, I'm one of your better customers here. You really don't want to tick me off. What would most of you do at this point? You know I like the ring, right? So what would most of you do? You'd start talking up the ring, right? Or maybe you'd try to see if you could sell me both of them, maybe by offering me a steep discount, OK? But you're not Judy. Judy does not leave $2,500 on the table. That is not in her, in her DNA. It doesn't happen. This is what she did to me. Now, please keep in mind, as I tell you this story, remember that we are the only two people in the store. If there had been people around when she did this to me, I, I think I would have been very offended. I think I would have been. But because we, there was nobody there, keep in mind, don't be very careful. Also, keep in mind, I'm one of her better customers. She knows me. This is what she did. First of all, she did this with the glasses. 
Okay, anybody who does that with glasses, you know you're in trouble. Okay, right off the bat. She goes, Cliff, you've been a customer of mine for some time right now. Um, you know, and, and, I, and I think we're kind of becoming friendly. Do you mind if I ask you a personal question? I said, no, Judy, go ahead. Are you a workaholic? You and your, are you workaholics, you and your wife? I said, what? She goes, are you workaholics? Is all you people, all, all you people do work, work, work? Is, is this what, because let me tell you something, Cliff. This is not the first time I've heard this from you. Every time you come in here, I have heard this before. You want to buy things for every day. You want to buy things from work. But is work the only thing that, that goes on in your life? I mean, don't, don't you people have a life, you two? I mean, I said, I said well, well, Judy, well, well, wait a minute. And she goes, no, wait a minute. L let me talk for a second, Cliff. First of all, let me tell you something about your wife that you probably haven't realized. Your wife is a woman. I said, well, wait a minute. Hold, well, yes, I'm, I'm, I may not be the brightest light in the, sh light in the Christmas tree, but I think I can figure that out, that she's a woman. No, no, you don't understand what I mean. You're a very practical, hard-headed, dull, boring guy. Your wife, though, is a romantic. Yes, yeah, so, she works hard. She's a professional lady. I understand that. But she's a romantic. Women are romantic. We like fantasy. We like romance. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm sure she has appreciated all the jewelry you bought for her in the past, and I'm sure she wears it with pride. But deep in her heart of hearts, she wants you to do something crazy. She wants you to do something that doesn't have a reason. Ladies, am I right about this? She wants you to do something that's wild and romantic. And, and if you do, it'll knock her off her feet because the last thing that, it's the last thing that she's expecting from her dull, boring, workaholic husband. And as she's telling me, she's basically calling me a loser to my face. Is what she's doing. And she's pointing me, she's poking me in the chest, whacking me against the wall as she's doing this. You know, physically, she's backing me against the wall. And she goes, let me tell you something else, because I'm not finished with you. If you buy this, that tennis bracelet for your wife, not only is she going to absolutely love it, she's going to, she's, I, I guarantee, if you, when she opens that box, she's going to be speechless for 10 minutes. She's not even going to be able to talk because it's the last thing she's expecting from you. And what's more, with that kind of an incentive, you're going to start joining some organizations. You're going to start getting involved in some boards of some charities. You're going to start looking for reasons for her to show that tennis bracelet off. This world is going to, you're going to help make this world a better place by buying this piece of jewelry. Now, will that be credit or check? I swear to you, that was almost word for word the transcript of our conversation. And of course, how am I reacting to this? I'm laughing like a kid because I see exactly what she's doing. I'm not offended at all. I, 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 I know Judy and I know how she is. Now, again, if there had been people around me, I would have been really ticked off about this. But the two of us in the store, who cares, right? So I asked her, I said, well, look, if she doesn't like it, can I bring it back in 30 days? Yeah, fine, no problem. I bought the tennis bracelet. Christmas morning, my wife opens that box. She, her jaw dropped to her knees and she did not speak for like 15 minutes. She couldn't believe that I had bought anything like that for her. Judy was 100% right about this. And my wife and I are now involved in some charities and some organizations where we go to more formal occasions and I have since bought her a couple of other pieces, you know, because let's face it, we gotta have an excuse to show this off. I have an investment in this thing, right? So I gotta, I gotta start finding ways for her to show it off. Um, Judy, did me, Judy did me a huge, huge favor by doing what she did, which is probably why I will always buy my jewelry from Judy of J. Albert Johnson on the Black Rock Turnpike in Fairfield, Connecticut, right next to the show. Look, I signed an agreement. I have to do this or she'll sue me. I mean, I gotta do that. She's the kind of person who will do that. So I gotta, I gotta be, I, it's on tape, Judy. I, I fulfilled my contract, okay? That is, how, whatever word, some people like to use the word relentless too. Um, Forgive me, I'm not saying you have to be a macho, chest-beating kind of person to be a successful entrepreneur, but shrinking violets, shy people, tend not to do this well in, well in this world. You can be quiet and still make an impact, but you gotta get out there and you gotta stick your, your face in people's faces. People do not know, the world is not made for small business. The world is made for giant corporations with billion dollar advertising budgets. For you to get your name and known out there, you gotta do crazy things sometime to stick, you get your message across to people, to stick your name in people's faces to make sure they remember you. You gotta do everything short of a circus act sometimes to get the word out there about who you are and how good you are. And if you're the kind of person who hides your light under a bushel, it's gonna be a tough thing to do. Um, whatever word you, you use, I don't care what word it is, but it's a quality you're gonna have to develop at some point if you intend to succeed at what we're going to be talking about in the rest of this program. So those are my three qualities. A successful entrepreneur is a cynical person. They're not illusion. They're not illusionists. They look at the world the way it really is and figure out how to exploit what's out there as opposed to taking an idea and trying to bring it into the real world. Uh, intellectuals do the latter. Entrepreneurs do the former. 
Secondly, they're insecure, often to the point of being neurotic, because that's what keeps them focused. They're never, ever sure that they're getting things right, because that's what keeps them focused, and that's what makes them successful. Last but not least, they are aggressive, they are pushy, they do whatever they have to do to get their message in front of people, uh, because it's not going to happen any other way. You know, if you're, if you're the kind of person that decides that they need $250,000 a year, you know, pre-tax to live on, then if you make $200,000 a year, you have failed. That's failure, even though most people could probably live very well on 200,000, but that doesn't matter. If your goal is 250 and you only hit 200, you have failed. You need to do everything you can, short of breaking the law, to get that extra $50,000 in your, in your bank account, if that is your goal. You do not stop at second best, and whatever messes happen, you clean them up later, you make your apologies later. Uh, Lord, make, give, me, give, me, give me the chance to show you that making, but building a billion dollar business will not change me anyway. Let me build that billion dollar business and I will show you some wonderful things that I will do for this world. But first I gotta get that billion dollars in the bank. Everyone knows, by the way, when people get like a billion dollars, they start setting up charities and doing all that kind of stuff. Well, a lot of that is they're looking for tax breaks, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm a little too cynical for that. But a lot of it is, I think, guilt. A lot of it with these people is they had to do a lot of nasty, nasty things to get that billion dollar business up and running. And this is their way of showing the world that they're basically still good people. This is their way of atoning for their sins. And I think a lot of that, that's a lot of reasons why billionaires often do that. It's a way of showing the world, look, I won this race, but I'm the guy who should have won. And let me show you now all the wonderful things I'm going to do because I am basically a good person. That's the, the attitude. But first you've got to get that billion dollars. And you may have to do some things that you know, may keep you awake at nights to get, that, to, get to that billion dollars. You know, but you may never get there unless you do them. That's my lesson. So with that now, we can proceed to the rest of the course. Let's start talking now about the 12 steps that you have to go through to build a successful business in the real world.